What do you see as the biggest challenges, obstacles to not just the work you do here, but your philosophy as a whole? Uh, the biggest challenge, I think, is, well, first of all, ignorance. People just don't understand these ideas. They don't, they don't understand cryonics. They think it's some strange thing due to dead people, rather than understanding it really as an extension of emergency medicine, which is the way that it should be observed. Um, and I think the other problem, even if they know about it, the problem is fear. So it's very frequent for me to, you know, people come on a tour of Alcor and we explain how it works and they'll say, mm, you know, that kind of makes sense. I can see that might actually work, but oh, I hope it doesn't work because I'll be so afraid of coming back into a world that's so alien and foreign and I'll be out of date and my skills will be out of date. Uh, so many people would rather die than, you know, learn to get used to a different future, which I find very strange. So our members are probably a little different from a lot of the population. They, they're more adventurous in spirit. They, they say, yeah, things will be drastically different. Fine, being Aboriginal Australians who've gone to New York City. Well, it's hard to imagine that this change is going to be much bigger than that one. That's, that's a pretty drastic change of things to get used to. It's an interesting coincidence that we're filming this today because just today the press release came out from the Brain Preservation Foundation. Um, and that, what they've been running is a contest for different groups to use either chemical fixation or cryopreservation methods. And the prize would go to the first group to demonstrate the you know, absolute preservation of ultrastructure, the fine structure of the brain. And that prize was, was won um, by the cryonics side, essentially. Although what they actually used was a bit of a mixture. They used some chemical fixation, aldehyde fixation, to keep things in place and to stop the dehydration of brain material. And then they cryopreserved it or vitrified it. And they demonstrated very excellent preservation under electron microscope of neural tissue. It's a little unusual job to be running a chronics organization, so people often say, how do you end up here? And, you know, so it's actually kind of hard to explain. By the time I was 16 or 17, I was really interested in life extension. Not just health, but actually life extension. So it's probably unusual before I'd even stop growing, I was interested in extending the maximum lifespan. If we have some warning, if we know that someone is terminal, we will send a team, a standby team, that's what they'll do literally, we'll stand by in the hospital with our equipment, and uh, these days hospitals tend to be pretty cooperative, so they usually let us keep this either in the room or maybe in the room next to them. So currently, given the law, we have to wait until the doctor says, I declare you to be legally dead. Uh, at that point, what we do is we move the patient from the bed into the ice bath. We're going to cover them with ice. So this initial cooling is very important. The warmer you are, the faster things are going to fall apart. So we want to get you cool as quickly as we can. The goal really is to protect the cells just as you would do if you were harvesting a heart or kidneys or other organs and trying to get them across the country. So people understand this part of it in hospitals. They, they, they understand what we're doing. We're trying to maintain biological viability for as long as possible. It's impossible to give a date you know, to say that, you know, in 2087, well, it'd be nice better to do that to say, you know, on February 2nd, 2087, we'll better revive people because people would love that. They would sign up in much larger numbers because we're giving them a nice clear answer and certainty and that's what people like. Unfortunately, we're much too honest and we say, you know, really we have no idea. It's going to be decades, at least it could be a century. We don't know. It depends on so many developments that you can't really foresee. We're kind of a little bit like Leonardo da Vinci who could design wings and helicopters, which would actually work, but he didn't have the tools to build them back then. But he could show in principle that these would work. So what we're doing is a little bit like that. Um, of course, we are developing the technology to reduce the damage done to our patients to get them cryopreserved. But we don't know exactly how we'll reverse that process right now. We know we can reverse it with certain very small creatures. We've cryopreserved this tiny microscopic worm called C. elegans, which has been very well studied by scientists. We've actually been able to teach that certain tasks, uh, what direction to go to find food, for instance, then cryopreserve it, uh, rewarm it, and we've been able to prove that it remembers what it learned. Um, now, going from that to a whole organ is difficult. That's kind of the cutting edge right now. Um, it's quite plausible within the next five or ten years we'll be able to take kidneys and hearts and cryopreserve them and put them in a, you know, a cryobank at the hospital. So if you need an organ transplant, rather than hoping to get a tissue match across the country and rush it on ice, you just pull it out of the bank and then it'll be ready. So that is actually quite near future. So you just told us what happened there. So what, hap what happens now? What happens once you come into this room? So there's different stages to the process. And what we just saw 
is the, the standby uh, stabilization and transport. So we're stabilizing the patient, getting them here to Alcor. We'll then bring them in through the back doors here and put them on the operating table. Uh, the cover will be off. This goes on later on so that we can cool the patient with liquid nitrogen vapor, but this would be off normally for the procedure. We have several surgeons on call. We don't have enough cases to have a full-time surgeon. Um, they will come in and they will do what is essentially like a median stenotomy. They're going to open up the chest, access the major blood vessels of the heart, cannulate those, and then we're going to run that through our heat exchanger um, and gradually remove the blood and body fluids, also the, the, the fluids within the cells, and gradually replace that with the cryoprotectant solution. Our process itself, we introduced this cryoprotectant, uh, essentially a medical grade antifreeze, that has a certain level of chemical toxicity. Now that's a good trade-off because it eliminates ice formation, and so you've massively reduced the amount of damage to the body cells. So you can have a technology that can reverse that damage and the aging process itself, because there's not much point bringing back a 95-year-old if they're going to be 95 years old. So the idea is to bring them back in a fresh, healthy, rejuvenated body. Now, furthermore, some of us, including myself, have chosen just to preserve this part, because all the rest of this is replaceable. In terms of current members signed up, it's a little over half for huh. the neuropatients. Some people call it decapitation, but of course that's wrong. We're not taking the head off, we're taking the body off. Yeah. <laughs> the, the brain is the part we want. We'll then take it over here and put it in the neuro ring, upside down, the cephalon, which is the brain plus the skull. We don't try to rem remove the brain from the skull because that's actually quite difficult to do and it's likely to damage it. And this is a pretty useful bit of protective packaging anyway. There's a lot of lines of evidence coming together now. It's a hospital in Pittsburgh working with a researcher from the University of Arizona in Tucson. They're actually taking people all the way down to about 10 degrees, which is very cold for human surgery. And what that does is, it, of course, it slows everything down. It's the same principles in cryonics. And so that allows them to operate on people like gunshot wound victims who otherwise would be inoperable. They'd just be bleeding out too fast. But it gives them about four times as long to do the surgery. The lead researcher, Peter Ree, Dr. Peter Ree uh, from the University of Arizona, actually came to Alcor and you know, did the tour and we talked to him. And uh, in the past, you know, like 20 years ago, we would have expected him to say, oh, these crazy cryonics people, my work's got nothing to do with that. He didn't say that, uh, both to us and actually in the press. He, he said, I think this is quite a reasonable thing to do. It's a lot more radical than what I'm proposing, but it's the same essential principle and kind of makes sense. So that's uh, a bit of a sea change that we're seeing there. So I really do think this will become a normal practice at some point. Uh, at some point in the future, people will look back on the present and really scratch their heads and wonder why why do we throw our loved ones in the ground or want these big ovens to incinerate them when they could have been cryopreserved? So at some point, I think this kind of social pressure against the idea is going to go away. It could even be 10, 20 years from now. A lot of hospitals will have cryonics units that start the processes and probably you know, pass you off to a cryonics organization for long-term care. Oh, you did tell me the family, that some of the family, that one, only one of the families have ever watched the thing, which seems complete, does seem gruesome to watch. The only a couple, of, the, yeah, a couple oh. of families have watched. Oh, a couple of families have watched yeah. it. Well, in one case, it was the son, who actually is an old friend of mine, but uh, you know, he's very familiar with the process and he was going to have it done himself, and he actually stood behind the glass and watched the whole thing. Uh, in, in the case of our Thailand patient from last year, the whole family watched, apparently. So, but that's pretty unusual. Most people don't really want to, yeah. don't want to observe the pr procedures. So you don't want to see surgery in the hospital either. It's not something... It's not for me. Do people actually have, as part of their agreement, do they have, this is what we want? I mean, is that... Tell me about that. People can certainly make their wishes known in the paperwork when they sign up for cryonics with alcohol. They can specify, for instance, and some people do that. They, they say, don't revive me until you can revive my, my spouse or my parents or my children. So they come back as a family unit, and that makes a lot of sense, obviously. And it also removes that, that concern that you'll be all alone. I think most people, what they want is to come back pretty much as they are at the healthiest and then decide, you know, look around the world and see what's possible and what people are like and what's available and then make those decisions. It's a little bit hard to make those decisions, you know, for a hundred years from now, not knowing exactly what that will mean or who will make those choices. So these are really like gigantic thermos flasks. So, you know, they're just kind of cool to the touch, but inside they're extremely cold, minus 320 Fahrenheit. You can tell, right? Oh, yeah. So like a very large, very expensive thermos flask. And they don't use any power. That's one of the common misconceptions. People say, what happens if the power goes out? Well, nothing, because liquid nitrogen just pours off at minus 320 Fahrenheit. So, and this is where they will stay for as long as it takes. Essentially, once you're in here, you don't know whether it's a day or a century, and it doesn't make any difference. There's nothing happening biochemically. There's nothing moving. There's no molecular motion. So it really doesn't matter how long it takes. 
Of course, you want to come back sooner rather than later because other things could go wrong. You know, maybe the organization could fail for some reason. Um, but in terms of you know, pure physiology, it doesn't make any difference. There are some existing laws that actually will be quite helpful when, we, if, when and if we revive cryonics patients. Um, for instance, there are already laws in place now so that if someone is declared dead because they're lost at sea or disappeared for years and then they suddenly reappear, just like in the soap operas used to do this all the time, right, where someone apparently died and then came back. It does actually happen in real life. And there are laws in effect that allow you to get back your identity. And it is possible actually to set up an asset preservation trust. So resources will be kept for you, you know, get money back when you, when you come back. So that part of the problem is already solved. But what we really need sometime between now and then is a change in the legal status of our patients. So right now, people are essentially donating themselves as biological material for, for a scientific experiment. But we would like the law eventually to recognize that uh, these are potentially people, they're potentially revivable, they're essentially like people in a deep coma, and so they have rights. They can't be just dis be disposed of at any time. Um, obviously, they don't have the rights to sign contracts and so on because they're not conscious, um, but they're not disposable objects. We do occasionally have relative visits. Um, we have, actually every year we have our annual meeting and one of our directors, his first wife is cryopreserved, so he'll typically come in here and you know, just say, say hello to her. Um, so yes, we do some visitors who occasionally visit and sort of say hi. It's a tricky emotion because if you, well, let's say you, you don't believe in an afterlife, then you're saying goodbye you know, forever and maybe you can then kind of get over it. But in this case, you know, we don't know for certain we'll bring people back. You know, we hope that we'll come back. So you could have sort of saying sayonara but it'll be a lot later that you see them, so it's a little bit difficult. Uh, sometimes what people will do, and I've suggested this to a number of people, they might write a letter once a year to, let's say it's your wife or your husband or your father, uh, write them a letter once a year. It keeps them alive in your mind emotionally, and of course they'll actually get to see what happened while they were cryopreserved and catch up when they come back. That's nice, that's that lovely. I'm not sure what the effect would be of the first person coming back. I, I think possibly by then we will have being able to cryopreserve so many different organs and reverse that, that people will be expecting it to happen. And we'll probably have done it to simple animals and then more complex animals before we do it to humans. I'm sure we won't you know, revive a human before we can do a dog and a cat. So I'm not sure if it will be as big an impact as we think. Um, we're not going to do this tomorrow and suddenly bring someone back. I can, I can assure you that's not going to happen. That would certainly have a drastic effect. Um, but I think by the time it's possible, so many things will have advanced in so many areas that it will be almost like, well, of course you can do this. You know, it's just been, you know, we're just waiting for that to happen. People get very used to these things. I think a great example is in vitro fertilization. It seemed very futuristic when it first happened and people were very you know, worried about it. Well, does that mean these children won't have souls? Will they be some kind of zombies? Now it's a very common thing. It's been done you know, millions of times and there are people walking around who, actually there are people walking around who were cryopreserved. It's just that they were embryos at the time. <laughs>